There's hat raffles happening throughout the event. So this is a way to get swag even without traveling, which is super duper. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that we will be collecting. Um, please feel free to send Q&A. And um, at the, after the speaker is done with their presentation, uh, they will be going through your, your Q&A. So feel free to go ahead and send that Q&A in chat. And then we'll be, we'll be getting that to the speaker. And it will be fabulous. So thank you. Please allow me to introduce uh, Miss Laura Johnson, who's going to be talking about cyber harassment, things I wish I knew when stuff goes sideways. Laura Johnson is a senior security engineer who started her career by joining the military, unaware of how much she would fall in love with security and things. Earlier in her career, Laura held roles such as maintenance integrator, network engineer, consultant, and managing security engineer. Laura has firsthand experience in regards to cyber harassment and would like to share her knowledge to assist individuals in options. So with that, uh, over to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have one of the normal stories of how you come about a talk is sitting outside another conference with a few people saying, I wonder if this would be a good idea. And then having the support, luckily, of many friends to get me to the point where I could put this together and I could um, start to really speak about it. So with that, I am honestly just a regular old human being who has way too many animals in the house and hopefully all of them stay quiet or don't walk across the keyboard during this. Um, one of the oddball things that happened to me was receiving, I mean, five, six pager manifesto style emails as well as texts and things. And that led me to quite the situation of where I kind of looped into the trolley moment. Um, for those of you who don't know that scenario, um, it's where you're, you know, in charge of this trolley, it's coming down the tracks and you have to make an option between somebody that you know and strangers that you don't. That's one of the scenarios for it. And they always ask, you know, from an ethics side, what you would choose. Well, this was a very interesting situation for me because by speaking out about this, I, you know, have to run the risk that um, people will know who I'm talking about and maybe that person will get more angry at me or um, one of the biggest anxieties to that is what if, you know, people think I'm lying or nobody believes me. Um, so in reality, I'm not in control of the trolley at all. I'm kind of laying next to the person who sent me those manifesto emails, to be honest with you, because um, at least that's how I feel, that there's a chance that by speaking out that you know I would get this backlash. But the more that I thought about this, the more I realized that who I am is that person who has the opportunity to speak out about it, who has the opportunity to be um, an ear for somebody else that's going through this. And I would rather be in that position than be too scared um, to speak out. But I completely understand people who are, because I was right there. One of the biggest things I want to point out before I get started is I am absolutely not a lawyer. I hired a very good one um, to handle this case. Um, throughout the process, and I am definitely not a therapist. I am an ear for anybody who needs to talk, um, but I also had to hire a stellar one as well to get through the trauma and mental anguish that went with this. So please, if you ever need somebody to speak to, I'm absolutely here for you, um, but I am neither one of those things. So for harassment in general, I wanted to start out here because defining, her, defining harassment has been a very difficult process, not only for myself, but for my lawyer. Um, and my lawyer is the one who used the term that a judge is just a stranger in a robe, or you have a jury that is just strangers to you. So unfortunately, there's some sort of factors that line up where you are worried about, and your lawyer sometimes tells you to be worried about, you know, how you appear in court, how you speak in court, if you know, you're scared, could that change things? Um, it's very unfortunate with the way that that works. But one of the biggest tips that I got in that scenario is to always be factual and not emotional if you can be, which is definitely not easy. 
um, by any means. And the harassment laws absolutely have not caught up with online lifestyles. However, there are a few interesting ones that as I was going down the line that I was very surprised about um, finding out. For instance, when I looked into different states, Colorado puts in that the school districts are subject to all federal laws and states prohibiting discrimination. And they go into, when you're prohibiting that discrimination, that also falls into an electronic act or gesture or pattern or bullying to coerce or intimidate and to cause physical or emotional harm. So they do loop those in to that factor. But unfortunately, when I was going through this process, uh, my lawyer was not truly aware of that. However, they were a fantastic lawyer and really helped out during this. You also, um, I looked into Arkansas, which was a person who commits the offense of cyberbullying. And this can be he or she transmits, sends, or posts a communication by electronic means with the purpose to frighten, coerce, or intimidate, or threaten, abuse, or harass, or alarm another person. So these laws are here to protect you just individuals haven't caught up with the knowledge base of it. And that includes the lawyers and the judges as well. So that it loops into the next thing I constantly heard was, well, what about my freedom of speech? I should be able to say whatever I want to say, that's my right to do so. And the more I dug into that, that is absolutely not true. You do not have the right to hurt somebody. You don't have the right to threaten somebody. And those tend to get a little bit of a gray area. And if you look it up in the dictionary, I highly suggested for a slight laugh for a minute, because really your legal right to express an opinion, it, you would think that that could fall into saying something to an individual that could potentially hurt them. So what is not protected is that harming other scenario. If the words that are coming out of somebody's mouth, onto somebody's paper, online, has an intent to harm you in any way, shape, or form, you do have a right to stand up for yourself. You have a right at any point in time during that if you feel threatened to report that and look into what you could do to get yourself protected so you don't have to keep enduring it over and over and over. So the emails and texts and direct messages, all of the above, loop into that cyber changing the definition of what is harassment. Since, you know, AOL chat rooms and before, <laughs> I'm dating myself there. Everybody looked at stalking and harassing as somebody in your bush, somebody who's knocking on your door, following you to work. That's no longer the case anymore. So cyber has really changed what it really means to stalk and harass somebody. That somebody no longer has to really find out where you live and find out how to get to you from a physical level. Now they just can sit at their desk, crack a laptop, and you know, pay $5.99 and find out every one of your addresses, what car you drive, phone numbers, et cetera. Uh, it's absolutely terrifying what you can get online. And even if you don't have much of a base of, you know, like my current job to find out information, my 12 year old figured out how to get to the sites to pay money to find some of his friends. The biggest advice that I could give though on this is do not become your attacker. Look at getting your legal counsel involved for a protection order, a restraining order, before you block anybody, before you, you know, if you block, you're gonna lose your evidence and you don't wanna do that. Remember that your, any reply that you put down is going to also be recorded as that evidence. So that's where it's kind of that old saying of treat others how you wanna be treated. Don't fall into treating someone how they are treating you. If you fall into that, you will end up in court with a judge or possibly a jury looking at you in a way that you didn't intend to happen. And it was because you were thinking you were doing the right thing by sticking up for yourself. So there's many, many ways 
that being online enables your harasser. I don't want to go into too many of them, seeing that I don't want to give somebody who may be trying to stalk somebody more tips to the trade to hide. I will say as an amusing note, with the sometimes words hurt more, if I had a time machine after what I have been through, the first thing I might do is go back in time and kick the person in the shins who said the whole sticks and stones, you know, may make bare bones, but words will never hurt me. I need a time machine for that individual. During my process, I genuinely thought that my feelings weren't valid. I genuinely thought that I was wrong and I was being too sensitive. I spent many nights trying to figure out what was wrong with me, why words on an email or a screen or a piece of paper were bothering me so, so much. And it wasn't until I was sitting in a courtroom with a stack full of emails, watching a judge read them over, and then hearing my final judgment come across that I finally, honest to goodness, broke down in every way, shape, or form and just cried. And I was trying to stay so, so strong through this whole process and try to keep telling myself that what I was reading wasn't true, um, that I was being irrational. And to have a judge read my final judgment really said to me that this, this is wrong. What people are doing right now is wrong. And that's where I really started doing some research. What worked for me though, when I felt helpless was doing that research and finding that I wasn't alone, that there were individuals that could help me, that there were therapists that could help me, that there were therapists that deal with the mental abuse that happens online. That is where I learned to take my evidence and put it into a place where I would not continue reading it over and over and over again, creating forwarders so that my lawyer would be getting the information, not me. My lawyer would be the one who would call me or let me know that I needed to you know, be more cautious if I was traveling to a certain location, be more cautious if I'm going into my office. If there were things that I absolutely needed to know, they would inform me. I was very fortunate to get that advice and take that advice because before the advice came, I was rereading things. I, I was pouring over them and crying and, and questioning myself left and right. One of the things I never expected was I applied for FMLA for work because I had to take a significant amount of time off court and therapy. And I really genuinely thought FMLA was for people who had babies or a family style emergency. I never thought that it would be for trauma counseling and it was. I was able to get approved. I was able to feel that I could heal and work on myself and not have to worry about then losing my job on top of everything else. And turning and finding people who were supportive was one of the things that really helped me get out of that helpless stage, really trusting somebody to let them know what was going on with me, how I was feeling, and that they were there for me. Because as I said before, I really did feel like I was just being too sensitive. And pe there were individuals that told me I was being dramatic. There were individuals that told me that, you know, this person is such a nice person and, and there's no way that they meant that. And I must be taking it out of context. And between the therapy and the supportive friends and, you know, the judgment that finally came through, I was able to see that, you know, I was valid and I had a right to feel that way. In this day and age too, I hear a lot of comments from my situation that at least I wasn't physically harmed. And I really hope that throughout the process, people will start to realize that both, both need to be recognized as a problem. That the mental trauma that people endure on a day-to-day -day basis is just as real as getting punched in the face. These are some of the quotes from the emails that I received. And when I received these, I truly 
just hit the bottom of feeling helpless. I was scared to go into my office. I was scared to walk out my door. I was scared to log into my computer. I wasn't sure who I could talk to, who I could trust, who I could tell about this. I was scared if I showed my job that I you know, may or may not be ambushed at work, that they would choose to fire me instead of keeping me on. When in reality, my office was incredibly supportive. They were very helpful in keeping you know, me feeling safe. But that initial reading of that, I mean, just threw me for the biggest loop because I really started to question whether I should just comply with this person, whether I should do everything they were asking me to do just to make this stop. But no matter how many times I complied with anything, it just kept getting worse. And kind of the icing on the cake was knowing what they did for a living. And they highlighted it here in the email. And then I really, truly felt helpless. I truly didn't know how to get out from underneath this. So I was able to keep myself very safe and very secure once I had the information of how to do so. Starting out this process, I didn't know about the FMLA. I didn't know that a lawyer could help get me a protective order. I had no idea. I truly thought that if somebody is sending you emails or chats, you just block them and you try to move on with your life, no matter how many screen names they start, no matter how many platforms they go after you on, that it's just something you have to live with. And that's absolutely not true. It is not something that you have to live with. You can get protected. Even if it's something as small as having just that five, 10 minutes to turn off your laptop and have somebody to talk to, it's really not small. It will help you get through what's going on. Then you'll be able to take those steps forward of how can I get myself safe? What does it mean for me to feel safe? And for me, that really meant having that protective order to make sure myself and my son stopped being contact, that the abuse stopped. It really meant me having to file for this FMLA and have that moment to breathe away from work and get the healing that I needed to get. One of the hardest things, though, about keeping myself safe was not just running blocks left and right and being able to not see anything because as the lawyer told me, I cannot miss any of the evidence because everything is needed. As I started doing the research into you know, who else is having these problems, one of the biggest moments of just sadness that swept across me, but then strength that came from that was reading the foundation that I have highlighted below and what they are doing for kids, what is going on with students, how students are feeling, how children are feeling, what the suicide rates are of kids. It's astronomical since everybody's really chatting more online now that all of your lives are online. It has really changed. And the foundation was founded in 2007 after the founder's daughter took her life. And that was due to a complete hoax by a neighbor who was posing as a boy on MySpace who harassed her to the point where she did not feel that she wanted to live anymore. And after she lost her life, the foundation was founded to try to reach out to more students, to more children, to more young adults, and to adults to try to get the information out there to try to get help. All of this information too is years back. And I wanted to use that information because of the fact that we are so much now further down on having our lives online. If 34% of students are reporting cyberbullying in 2015, it's going to be very interesting to look and really dig into what you know, 2020, 2021 has to come for this. And that's only those that are reporting it. I talked to my son, I talked to his friends, I talked to kids that, that come over to my house quite often about this, how they're feeling about this. And they said, well, we're just, we were told not to be sensitive. You can't be sensitive. And so a lot of this isn't being reported. 
one of the hardest statistics out of that 34% is that 18% of that youth has reported self-harming at least once due to what they are getting online. 6% of those students reported that they are digitally harming themselves on purpose because it's already happening to them anyway. So they are just continuing the problem. And it has found that anyone who has the cyberbullying is at much, much, much greater risk of that self-harm and suicide. The CDC in 2017 also listed suicide as the second leading cause of death for those 10 to 34. And the attempts among adolescents and teens had doubled since 2008. These statistics show us that we need to have a change. We need to have a change to how online is handled, how it's viewed, trying to get people to understand that words do matter, words do hurt, and mental abuse is very, very real. The problem with having individuals behind a keyboard who may not always feel comfortable saying something mean to someone in person, all of a sudden feel like they have this enormous strength where they can say whatever they want because they're hiding behind a screen. And I personally haven't found a way to even start to help these kids. I have been doing massive amounts of research on this. I have been trying to find ways to reach out to different communities to find out what can we do? What can we do to help lessen these statistics? Or what can we do to really get the individuals who are bullying online consequences for their actions? A couple of the parents that I spoke to after finding out that I was doing you know, these talks, after finding these foundations that I was starting to speak to, there was a couple parents of 10 year olds, 12, various ages that said they didn't have the strength to speak out yet. They, they just weren't at that point of healing where they could really speak out. But did let me know that the individuals that were harassing their child, there was no consequences for their actions. Even though they had proof, even though they had evidence, the laws just didn't line up in court when it came down to having somebody really take responsibility for what they had done to another human being. Importantly, the things that I did wrong, I want to say I was not in any way, shape, or form not responsible for some of the things that happened to me. It's one of the things I had to come to terms with that the questions of why didn't I just leave? Why didn't I just block everything and walk away? Why did I let it go on for so long and not do anything about it? And that was things I had to work on with myself, being able to get my self-esteem to the point where I could stand up and say, this, this is not okay, I deserve better. No human being deserves to be treated this way. Enough is enough and I'm going to walk away. The experience really has gotten me to understand of how strong one can really be when they need to be. But I will tell you that I fell into every single category here that is associated with this. There is not a single thing that I didn't go through, that I didn't go through thinking everything in this email was correct. What is the point of me even being here? I started questioning whether or not I was a good parent. Getting out of bed was difficult. Opening computer was difficult. What happens to your self-esteem when you're reading over and over and over again someone else's opinions of you? It reminds me of the saying of when someone keeps telling you, you that you did something even though you didn't do it, you finally just end up doing it because you got blamed for it. It kind of felt like that was scenario. I shut out everybody because I was so afraid that I was wrong and that my feelings weren't valid and I just shut them out. I didn't want to have someone else telling me bad things about myself. I was afraid that was gonna happen. I was afraid by somebody not believing me that I would feel more alone and more that I was being overdramatic. 
And then the biggest thing that it took me a long time to finally stop doing was that I kept continuously apologizing to the person who was harassing me and taking blame for things and saying that what they were saying was correct just so that it would stop. When in reality, when you start apologizing for things that you don't really want to apologize for, at least for me, I started believing them and it, it just made me go further and further down that rabbit hole. And one of the hardest things that I noticed with speaking to kids and the parents of children who are having cyberbullying problem is that feeling that you're not even safe in your own home because you can't open your laptop. It's no longer that you go to school and if someone picks on you at school, you come home and you feel safe in your home. But now with jumping on the cell phone, jumping online to play a game, that constant anxiety of, is that person who's harassing me gonna be there? You never get that sense of being home. But with that, there were many things that I did right after a period of time of really getting through it and finding out all of the knowledge that I needed and finding out the laws that I needed, getting the right attorney and pushing through it. Honestly, the day I got that protection order in my hand was the biggest breath of fresh air I have ever taken. And from then on, I just kind of kept stepping forwards, going up that hill, just making sure I could get over it. Because one of the things I get accused of quite often is that I'm obnoxiously happy, like to the point of annoying. And I don't ever want that to change. If somebody is annoyed with me because I'm obnoxiously happy, I will take it. I am good with that. Um, and one of the things that was kind of hard for me to do is not be able to get emotional when I was telling what was going on because people just didn't hear me. They automatically started judging the emotions or getting uncomfortable that I was crying or getting uncomfortable that I was angry. And they didn't hear me for what was really going on or if I needed you know, some help. I really needed some help and I, I needed to figure out a way to state facts and not state emotions. I definitely do not apologize anymore for things that I did not do. Um, it's someone else's dumpster fire. I think one of the biggest sayings that has come out of this is that's a you problem. I'm happy to help you with that. It's not a me problem. Um, versus saying, oh, that is absolutely my problem. I apologize for it and I try to fix it. Um, instead, I'd rather be supportive to somebody um, instead of apologizing for something that is not mine to own because I really can't fix it if it's not mine anyway. Um, taking ownership of my life was a huge thing that I did right. You know, get out of the, had to get out of that bed. I had to um, stop crying in the closet and <laughs> say to myself, okay, what, what one thing am I gonna do today to get this better? And the biggest thing I actually say to the kids now that are here in my home is, it's not one day at a time, it's not one minute at a time, it's one second at a time. One day is far too long. There's many things that can happen during the day. There's a million things that can happen during an hour or a minute. I'm just gonna take things one second at a time. What can I do in this second to try and take a step forward? And then I stopped replying to any harassing message. Just none. Just I started out with stop sending me these messages and then I just said, you know what? I have so much to do, so much to do. <laughs> that replying to these is, is not on my list of to-dos. I still wish, especially after all of the research I've done with children, all of the children that I've spoken to, the students at colleges too, I wish that I had the information to truly help them, to truly say, Here's how you're gonna find your harasser. Here's how you're gonna get your harasser charged. I know a few steps to kind of get yourself forward because I do know, um, at least the way I felt is like I was biking up a hill but the chain fell off a long time ago and I kind of am just sitting there trying to figure it out. So I kind of wanna be able to give you know people, here's your bike chain and, and you know what, here's a motor for your bike and let's get up there. Let's figure out how to get up there. So I wanna keep doing the research to find out more ways to really help somebody feel safe, feel safe in their home, feel safe, opening their you know text messages. One of the things that I found out 
to really keep an eye on is the signs that somebody is being cyber harassed. I mean, they're your normals of your heightened anxiety and fear that I had down to if somebody is suddenly not wanting to play online games anymore, they don't even want to carry their cell phone anymore. They take their laptop and just put it in a drawer, put it away. They don't want anything to do with it. Those are things where I would now start asking instead of, I would think you were just trying to take a day off of getting away from that keyboard asking, hey, are you okay? You know, something going on? You know, you feel all right? The nervous and jumpy when someone's text message alert goes off. And the extreme sleeping. I am a fan of sleeping, but, you know, 20, 24 hours, I want to make sure I ask my friends, are, are you okay? You know, even, are you sick? You know, are you not feeling well? Just making sure that I notice those things, that I'm not so wrapped up in, you know, what's going on in my life that I forget to really look at those little keys that friends of mine or family of mine are, are putting off and I'm not picking up on. One of the biggest things is knowing that it might be a long fight, but it's going to get better. It is going to get better. Even if it's finding the right counselor, finding the right lawyer, finding the right person to talk to finding the right art project to do to just feel better for a minute, it's going to get better. Please, please, please don't give up. I know there's times when it just seems like it's never ending, the harassment will never ever stop. It will, it will stop. You can get your life back, it will happen. So I do wanna thank again all of those people who were there for me, who have stood by me during this entire process, who were outside that conference when I said, hey, I have an idea, and I don't know if, if this is really a good idea. Every person has been so helpful to me throughout the way. All right. Um, Laura, thank you so much. Uh, this, is, this has been a really, um, really powerful session, and I appreciate you sharing. Um, Thank you. I wanted to. Uh, we've got we've got a, a couple of comments, and um, I wanted to, uh, to accentuate a, a couple of things that you said. Um, you, you talked about tools, and I, I think that's it's so helpful. Um, so there's there's FMLA, and um, this if depending on one's job situation, um, folks may have access to an employee help helpline that are uh, generally uh, generally anonymous. And <clears throat> depending if if you have this available to you, you go to to a third party who can make references to various um, various forms of assistance. Um, Laura, I didn't, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about um, uh, PTSD because as as you're talking about the, the harassment, and and you know, it, you you can break a bone or you know have a scar or it, physical injury, but uh, the mental injuries um, are very real, and so I, I didn't know if you wanted to talk. A little, a little bit more about that, or some of the some of the steps that that you went through um, as as you walk through that journey. It's because it's a journey. It's not. It's yeah. there's no snapping fingers, right? Absolutely not. Um, one of the things that I will be honest with that I got diagnosed with was Stockholm syndrome, which was one of the most shocking things to hear from the counselor because I never I thought that was you know being kidnapped. I never thought that that was really more along the lines of having somebody convince you that you were somebody else and having to walk through the steps of going through each process of saying to a therapist of, well, maybe I am not a very good parent. Maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe I do this. And the counselor would have to come back to me saying, well, why, 
Why do you feel that way? Is that something that you felt or is that something that someone convinced you that you felt? And having to honestly chip away at the things that kind of buried my self-esteem, the things that made me feel like I shouldn't even be an engineer anymore, that I should go back to being a waitress because I am not good at my job. That was another one I was convinced on. So just chipping away at those pieces that I was convinced were wrong with me. And that's where I look at the one second at a time. Because if you take one piece at a time and start really going through that, really finding out why you feel that way and boiling it down to, is that something you want to better within yourself? And maybe that's something that you don't feel quite right about yourself with, but you want to move forward with it. That's one thing. That's one thing of saying, hey, I have um, some strengths and some weaknesses, and I really want to work on these weaknesses of mine. It's another thing when all of these weaknesses that you're listing off are in emails, chats, and texts from somebody else that you have now gotten convinced are true. And having to dial those back and really realize that those are not who you are. And the other side to that that was really difficult for me is, is I got mean. I was mean. Like every time somebody said something to me I didn't like, I was firing things back that I was shocked was coming out of my mouth. And it was because it was just, pro it's, it's almost the same as getting a computer programmed. It's like I got recoded in my head of, of who I was. So it's really taking each little piece of yourself and, and taking it back and not feeling like somebody took it from you and you can't get it back because it's yourself and it's your strength and you know who you are on the inside and who you want to be. And that's who you need to, to push forward with in the therapy. And that's where you need to find those supportive people to surround yourself with. Yeah. Um, so a, lot, a, a number of comments were coming in during your presentation and, and um, you were not able to see them. I wanted to let people know that I have posted the link to the, um, to the foundation. Um, so that's in the chat. Um, and that's, uh, it's the Megan Meyer foundation dot, dot org. I want to put, while people are thinking about questions, oops, um, uh, here's a note that, um, that was left in the chat and, and, and interested in your thoughts, Laura, the best reply is no reply. And, you know, what makes sense to do when somebody says something that's really hurtful um what what are some of the you, you indicated that you know the, you you didn't reply what how did you get to that process how did you get to that place at that point i had a lawyer so once i had and i actually had the lawyer through the process i just had to be very careful how i word some of that because of um not giving away who this is in regards to um so i had a lawyer and what I did was I no longer replied. I forwarded those off. If my lawyer felt like they should apply, which I'd reply, then they would. If it was just a five page rant about how that individual felt I was as a human being, then there was no reply needed. And it was just evidence that kept getting cataloged. And, and that all was taken into court. And the fact that I didn't reply and that my lawyer didn't reply was also taken into court because if in my scenario, when there was no reply and emails just keep coming in and coming in and coming in and coming in, the judge is going to take a look at that and ask why. Why won't this individual stop? Because you're not feeding it. You're not asking them to talk back to you. You're not even giving them more information to write back to you. There's absolutely no reason for this person to be reaching out to you. Don't give that person a reason to continue to reach out to you. If you don't reply and they keep going, that is the best evidence you're going to be you're going to have walking into a courtroom. That's um, that's really powerful. And moreover, having a having a dispassionate third party receive the information and be in a position where they can, for example, they would be able to say, "Oh, if it's appropriate, oh, I want to get law enforcement involved, or oh, I want to get." some other stakeholder group involved, but but by you working with your attorney to make those decisions, I, that's 
that's really brilliant. Um, super, yeah, I mean, it's really the only way I could get powerful. through it. Yeah, it's the only way I could get through it because you do, as a human, you want to fight back. You want to fight back. You fight or flight at that point. And I didn't want either of those options. I didn't want out of my life, and I did not want to fight this person back. I just wanted to get away from them. And the lawyer was the easiest and best case that I ever had because I didn't have to dive further into the rabbit hole reading things about myself. That was that individual's job. I won't say that it was cheap because it was not cheap, but it was worth every single penny that I ever spent towards that. So um, uh, posted in the chat uh, for the attendees, uh, please check out the eval form. Um, and Laura, the, your, your, the timing and the pacing was fabulous. It was not too fast. Um, <laughs> people, so were, people were hanging on your words for sure. <laughs> We've got a couple of uh, pretty good questions here. First one, what do you wish a supportive loved one would have said to you early on in this process? Or what could have someone said to you to indicate that they were here for you and supporting you and they knew what was going on? Um, honestly, I wish one person had just said your feelings are valid. Like that's it, just how I felt was valid. Because in reality, let's say I never got the, the protection order. I never got the FMLA. I still felt that way. I still felt like I didn't want to get out of bed. I still felt like this person's words were correct. So if anybody could have honestly just said, your, your feelings are valid. You know, how can we talk about this? How can we help you, you know, get through this? I don't want someone to fix it for me. No one can really fix you. Nobody's broken. I don't, I don't ever want to be looked at like I was broken or anything along those lines, but I just felt so alone because I just thought no one would, they would want to fix or tell you how you feel. And I just needed somebody to understand how I was valid and what I was feeling. Um, so much appreciation in this room um, for powerful words, Laura. Um, any, any last words for our viewers today in terms of some next steps? What I, here's what I see. I see a survivor. Thank you. Uh, who put one foot in front of the next foot. And, and even on the days you didn't want to get out of bed, you got out of bed. Um, and so I appreciate that and I appreciate you. Thank you. And I appreciate everybody who took time. And honestly, just, you know, make sure you check out on each other and, and check in on kids. Um, it's scary to think that even they're online chatting all day in school now, all day. That's, my kid lives on his laptop from the moment he hits first period to the end. And no one's monitoring those chats. They're monitoring them for cuss words or bad language, sex language. They're not monitoring them for you know, calling someone a poop face all the time, that's not going to pop up. So it's just really kind of trying to get ahead of something we're already behind in. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think we'll leave it here. Um, thank you, Laura, so much for um, for sharing. I, I know this was, this was tough and part of it is, well, it's traumatic talking about it, but I, I hope you you feel encouraged. So many comments of um, really uh, gratitude for for sharing, um, and for the viewers, uh, thank you so much. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back at the top of the hour with the next presentation. Um, please fill out the form uh, to provide uh, feedback for for Laura and the presentation. Uh, uh, up next. Um, We've got uh, Into the Unknown in stage two, and um, uh, there'll be an event here uh, in 10 minutes. So thanks so much. Uh, be safe, be well, and we will see you next time. Take care.